So with that, let me start the meeting. My name is Paul Goldstein. I chair Community Boards 1, Waterfront Parks and Cultural Committee. And with me on the screen is Diana Sweetai, our Director of Planning and Land Use. And I don't know if our co-chair is with us yet. Uh, Andrew Zeltman, Zelter, I should say, is that person. I'm sure he'll be joining us shortly. So with that, why don't we get going? Uh, first item on the agenda is a presentation by the China Institute. We have several members of their staff joining us today. Uh, among them are James Heimowitz, who's the president. And I think uh, possibly to get us started is Cliff Priest, Director of Institutional Giving. So gentlemen, whoever wants to get it going, go for it. And we'd love to hear more about how you're doing and uh, you know, tell us all about your institution for those who don't know that much. Sure, James, go so, ahead and you take this off. I won't take up too much time because Cliff has a much richer way of presenting things, but um, it's just an honor and a delight to be here. As Paul mentioned, I'm um, James Heimowitz. I'm the president of China Institute. Um, just to give you 30 seconds background, I lived in China for 33 years, married to a Chinese, um, and came back to um, lead this organization, which was founded in 1926. Um, we work very closely with the um, Department of Education, helping with professional development for teachers, working closely with the school kids, teaching language. We teach Chinese as well, so we have three divisions, a school, a gallery, which brings in museum quality exhibitions. We're one of only three organizations certified to take national treasures outside of China. Um, and of course, we have our public and business program. I'm not going to take away the thunder from Cliff, who's going to give you a, a big in-depth discussion about it. But um, we moved to the neighborhood coming on five years ago, and it has been um, an extraordinary move. We moved from 9,000 to 52,000 square feet. We've reached out a portion of that um, back actually to the city, and our tenants include the command center for the NYPD first precinct which has an anti-terrorism squad, sort of caddy corner to the um, World Trade Center, um, which it, where, the, where actually the landlord were, helps provide to pay some of the ongoing operational costs. Um, but for those of you who don't know the stretch, we're located between West Street and Washington Street, Rector and Albany. And in this block, it's a kind of a mini microcosm. It's just a breathtaking delight to watch what's happened. Our entire building at 100 Washington slash 40, 40 Rector Street from the time we have come here has been converted into cultural organizations. So we share the ground floor with the Metropolitan College and we have the whole second floor and we have the whole first entrance space which is being under construction to open out to the um, public. But the entire building is now nonprofits. The latest one to join us um, in this building on the third and fourth floors will be the Orthodox Union. Um, we have the North America headquarters of Doctors Without Borders. We have urban social justice and um, what was the other one? I'm trying to remember uh, too many neighbors and we're just coming back. But we're watching a sort of what I call a revitalization of our micro community. When we first moved into this particular stretch, it was quite desolate and we still have some undeveloped space there. But um, what I call this revitalization led by nonprofits you know, because we came in, we were able to get, you know, five times our space that we couldn't have in Midtown where we were um, with state of the art facilities um, that what, you know, so, so we're just like delighted to sort of what I say, be a part of this um, micro community. Um, I think I'll hand it over. I just wanted to say welcome. Cliff has prepared something which will probably give you a lot better insight into the things that we do than my off the cuff discussion. I just wanted to introduce him and to say a big thank you to everybody here for the support that we feel from our community board and our neighbors as we work to make this an even more vibrant community. Thanks, James. And now I'm going to see if I can get our PowerPoint up on the screen. Yeah. 
and it's loading the file. If, it, if it's the China Institute, a renewed vision fulfilled in Lower Manhattan, then uh, then you were successful. Okay, great. Let me see. There we go. So this is a rendering of what we feel that our street front will be looking like after we finish our renovations, which actually began, we moved down to our building in 2015. And we are still moving along with getting our space developed. And let's see if the, where it is. There we go. So we were founded in 1926 with the first leading nonprofit organization focusing exclusively on China. And we were founded in collaboration with great educators, including John Dewey from the United States and Hushir, who worked at Teachers College and were instrumental in making it possible for Chinese culture to be more appreciated in this country. And in 1944, we received a gift from the Luce Foundation, which was a townhouse from which we operated until 2015. And in August of that year, we moved down to our 100 Washington Street entrance. As James mentioned, it's a 52,000 square foot facility. And this is going to be our permanent entrance to the facility once we get to the completion of our renovations of the ground floor, which I'll get to shortly. So these are the programs through which China Institute fulfills its mission. We have our School of Chinese Studies, which provides tuition-based programs for students of all ages, from toddlers to senior citizens. And it also, as James mentions, provides professional development programs for K to 12 educators. And also it puts out, uh, we collaborate with Bard College on music programming and other educational activities. We also have China Institute Gallery, our public programs, and the China Institute Center for Business. So here's the School of Chinese Studies. And so this slide shows you the variety of activities that take place from giving classes to small school children, music performances, and there's a professional development meeting there that you can also see on the screen. China Institute Gallery was established in 1966, and we have been presenting world-class exhibitions that have been very highly praised by the New York Times and others. Our exhibition catalogs have been called instant classics, and it, we have a wonderful relationship with Chinese museums that allow us to bring masterworks of Chinese art to the United States that have never been seen before. And both the school and the gallery provide services to New York City school children. The school goes into the classroom and teaches the history of China through a program called We, Live, we All Live in the Forbidden City. And for the gallery, we were having students come to the Institute and they would receive a combination docent led tour and arts workshop. We have public programs, essentially China Institute is the, the go-to place to learn about China, past, present, and future. And so these programs include arts, culture, family programs, food and fashion, and much more. We also provide the public programs on a Washington street, street front, primarily for Chinese New Year, but also for other cultural festivals. We had a block party as well. It was very popular in our neighborhood. And as James mentioned, the China Center for, Center for Business is the only nonpartisan, nonpolitical organization that provides platforms for communication and cooperation between business and thought leaders from both the United States and China. Let's 
since two th since last March, we have, like many other cultural organizations, had to move from in-person programming to virtual programming. But our staff was really astonishing in, in its ability to turn on a dime, and very quickly we were able to switch from in-person to virtual programming. This visual represents some of the work that's done by our School of Chinese Studies. We have a Mandarin story time where uh, families come in to have their children's books read in Mandarin. We also now do our in-classroom program digitally, and in some instances, we provide it digitally to the classroom, as you can see in the lower right. The same goes for our China Institute Gallery. We have an amazing archive of photos and uh, information from our long history that we've been using to create virtual exhibitions, in-depth demonstrations of the sort of scholarly, remarkable, and also the, in terms of the beauty of the works we give to people can go to this webpage and actually have a online tour through some of the great exhibitions that China Institute has had in the past. We also provide free art fund workshops, which are interactive workshops for families and our Discover China Through Art program, which I mentioned was involving the kids coming to the school, has now gone digital and we're able to provide classrooms information on Chinese art and culture and also lead them through arts workshops where they get to exercise their creativity. And our vast array of public programs is now also being delivered digitally. It's actually been remarkable how we've expanded our audience base who go well beyond the New York metropolitan community. And we have worldwide audiences for these presentations, which feature leading scholars, historians, and other people who are leading uh, thinkers on China's past, present, and future. So we moved into our building in, 19, in 2015, as I said. So far, we've concluded the renovations to most of our second floor, which includes our office space, the China Institute Gallery, our library, and our classrooms. We've also just completed interior renovations of another space in our second floor, which will also include uh, spaces suitable for scholarly lectures, lectures, film screenings, etc. And we're currently working on the renovations of our white box of our excuse me of our ground floor. It's a white box renovation that's supported in part by 1.3 million allocation from the city of New York. And also very glad to say that this renovation has also been made possible in large part because of the community board. I presented to the financial district committee to get a resolution from the full board in support of this program. And with that resolution, we were able to secure $335,000 in support from New York State through Empire State Development. This gives you a little bit of an idea of the sort of things that people will be able to see when they when the ground floor is opened. We'll be able to have contemporary art on a larger scale, uh, symposia, films, public performances, and actually the picture in the lower right is something that we've already had in that space, our Food and Ideas Festival, which combined a series of panel discussions and a night market and uh, outdoor mahjong and, and great food for everyone. This is a rendering of what our ground floor is going to look like from the entry into on from a Washington Street looking left. And that's going to be the staircase that's going to be taking our visitors from the ground floor to the top floor, which will link our services over the two floors. And this will be a very important breakthrough for us because currently all of the people who enter the Institute have to go through the office entrance at 40 Rector Street. And which means they also have to, they have to go sign in and, and deal with, with all that. Once we finish our 
renovations, people will be able to directly enter the Institute and we're planning to have the renovations done by the end of the calendar year. And this is another view of the space. It gives you an idea. It's a large place that allows for many different uses. And that's one of the things about the design that we put in because we want to be able to present a wide variety of programming there. We're also going to have a culinary center, which uh, will include a demonstration kitchen where we will be able to have teaching courses in Chinese cooking, which was something that was very important to the history of the Institute that we're bringing back after uh, quite a bit of time. This is the portion, the general overview of the Institute that I have in terms of a PowerPoint. If anyone's interested, I also have a separate uh, presentation on some of the upcoming exhibitions on China Institute Gallery. If, if anyone would like to see that. Okay, great. That was very comprehensive, very interesting. Um, so you said you expect the renovation of the ground floor. Does that include the entrance to be done by the end of the year? Yes. Okay. And um, when do you expect to resume uh, people actually visiting the museum? Any ideas yet? Sure, we're actually <laughs> moving forward to start our summer camp, which has been a very important part of our education program. And we have already, I believe, started to take registrations for the summer camp, which I believe will start in June. And for the remainder of the presentations we're aiming for after a later day. Okay, let me see, does any, do any members of the committee have any questions, comments they'd like to make? Alice, I see you are interested. Yeah, you I think, thank you so much for that tremendous presentation. I'm really interested to know what was going on there. And I've always been curious about that lovely little bit of space outside the building. And I saw that wonderful rendering. What I'm so, sorry if I missed it, though. Could you just tell us is that a public space and what will be going on there? It, I'm talking about in the exterior. Yes, it, um, the renovations are designed by Pay Partnership Architects, and they designed something which we are going to try to bring people in from the street in a very fluid way. We're also contemplating having a tea house and food services, and it's definitely going to be something that's going to animate the street and is designed to be very visible. It's a, sort of a very visible portal to Chinese culture. So is it a privately owned public space or is it a public space or is it what is yes, it exactly? we're not we're not on the list of city organizations with with city owned space. We are a private organization that have been ever since we were founded in 1926. And as I mentioned, we used to be located in a townhouse on the Upper West Side, and we were able to get our new space. We sold the townhouse, yeah, which we owned yeah. outright, and and, was, and we bought this new space outright. Okay, so this is a pri The exterior space is a private courtyard to your space that's not uh, accessible to the public so that could be closed let me help clarify alice it's accessible so it's owned by us but we plan to have it open to be used as either a tea house um or an area that's accessible to the public but it is owned by us it's not a public space if that's what you're asking i was just asking if it falls into the category of spaces that are called privately owned public spaces i actually don't have the record up here in front of me, so I assume not. Um, okay, right. thanks very much. Sounds great. Okay, um, let's see. I do not see any other people. Oh, Todd Fine from the public. Yes, hi. Uh, to be heard. Uh, I'll be brief. Just tell them who you are and yes. uh, go for it. Yes, my name is uh, Todd Fine. I'm the president of the Washington Street Advocacy Group and also a member of the Friends of the Lower West Side. And I, you may know a few years ago, we did a block party uh, in front of the Chinese Institute building for that neighborhood. And we focus also on 
ethnic heritage and international issues. So we we just want to we're, we're pleased to see this happening. And I, I did want to ask briefly, do you will any of these spaces potentially be available for public events or for rent or or could nonprofits ever use any of these spaces? Is that something you foresee? You know, we will be having casual rentals very much in the way that most nonprofit cultural organizations do. Um, you know, such as for events, weddings, and other, and we have collaborated with other cultural organizations to present stuff in our space. Actually, the very first public use of the ground floor space was to present a very large scale artwork with the Alliance Francaise. And so we, we've also collaborated with many other cultural organizations. So there's, there's a lot of, of meaningful collaboration that we hope to have take place. Thank you. So I'm just going to very quickly, uh, you know, just very quickly flash through slides of some of the artworks that are going to be coming up in the next series of exhibitions that are going to be shown at China Street Gallery. And it really demonstrates how what we have at our location is stuff that really can't be seen anywhere else. Even some of the things even at the large institutions do not, are not able to get some of the rarities that we get. And so So in fall of 2022, we'll be having eternal offerings, Chinese ritual bronzes from the Minneapolis Institute of Art. In 2023, a painting exhibition. In the fall of 2023, Treasures for Buddha, which is Buddhist art masterpieces. And so I'm just gonna just go through so you can see some of the pictures. These items come from the collection at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, which has probably the finest private collection of ancient ritual Chinese bronzes, and they're going to send us the best items in their collection for us to show. Actually, that owl figure on the right is one of the most famous uh, items in the entire museum. Flowers on the River, as I mentioned, is a painting exhibition. We'll be featuring masterworks from the Ming and Qing dynasties, a masterpiece called Flowers on the River by a painter called Baba Shanren, which has very rarely traveled from China. Why this thing doesn't work? There we go. And this will be the very first time that there'll be a complete survey of the different aspects of flower and bird painting, which along with landscape painting and figurative painting are the three most important genres in Chinese, in Chinese painting. And last but not least, Treasures for Buddha. This was one of the most important recent archaeological finds in China, in Nanjing. It was found at the site of the Dabaoan Temple, which is one of the most important sites in Buddhism. But this was actually buried centuries before that temple was created. And it was to house actual relics of the Buddha that were sent to China by the Emperor Ashoka in India. And there were relics sent to, I think, 15 different places in China. And so far, they've only been able to find two of the stupas that were buried with these relics. Um, we, we're not going to have the actual Buddha relics. Those are actually being venerated at a temple in China. But this are the, this is what housed the relics. And wait a second. There we go. And some of the items that were inside. And we're also going to have some wonderful art from the Ming Dynasty that was associated with the later Dabaoan uh, Tower. The Porcelain Tower was the most one of the most famous buildings of its age. Actually, it was the first Chinese piece of architecture that gained world renown. And, and so it was very much known in the Western world when it was first made. Unfortunately, it was destroyed in the 18th century, I think. And so that's our survey of what's coming up at Chinese Gallery. Um, I think we have one more uh, committee member who wants to comment, Richard Corman. Are 
You're muted, Rich. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I think you've got me now. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you so much for this, this wonderful presentation. The art is just astonishingly, it's breathtaking, really. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask a question, political question, if you will. Um, has the, uh, the, the, the political situation between the US and China over the last four years and perhaps bleeding over into this new administration to some extent, uh, affected the Institute in any way and your ability to present things, your ability to deal with uh, China and perhaps even the US government. I'm curious about that. We've, we've not really been affected in any major way in that, except that we've been very conscious of the difficulties that have emerged for, for instance, Chinese scientists trying to work in the United States and very conscious about all of the different pressures that are happening. But in terms of our day-to-day -day activities, we've, it has not affected our day-to-day -day activities in any way. I, I might just add a little point, in, add, add a little sentence in there, Richard, because um, look, we've been under intense pressure, actually. We're, our, our charter is non-political, so we don't get involved in politics. But I think that Americans' perception of China and vice versa has changed dramatically. And I think, um, it, you know, with, with all this recent, for example, for Asian hate crimes, people have asked us, for example, how are we involved in getting um, involved in this issue? And the short answer is, you know, hate and violence towards Asians in America emanates from ignorance. And the very core of what we're trying to do is to inform and to educate and to shed light, not heat. Um, so I think that in that regard, we're addressing some of those issues, um, but we haven't discussed that on a day to day because we're, we're not political we're cultural and educational. We've been spared a lot of the uh, venom that's been spewed at other organizations. That's very, very fortunate and. Uh, clearly, we've experienced the Asian hate here in, uh, in our. In our area, and certainly we'd want to do things to. Help you and all of us prevent that. Great, thank you. Yes, yes, we are working on that on a continued basis. So, um, all right, let me thank you, James and Cliff, for this excellent presentation. And certainly, good luck moving forward and keep us posted on all these great programs that are coming about. And we will publicize them or let people know about them if that's what you'd like. That would be great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Good night. All right, committee. Um, let's return to item number two, which is the Heritage Trail Wayfinding Markers. Um, as most of you know, we discussed this last month. We also discussed it at the full board meeting. We had drafted a resolution that basically was recommending against it. The Downtown Alliance, in the course of the full board meeting last month, actually um, came forward with responses to a number of the concerns raised by the community board. So perhaps should start with uh, Taina from the Downtown Alliance. Are you the one who's going to make the uh, presentation again and tell us where this stands and the changes that you've made and then we'll discuss it committee, okay? Great. Uh, thank you, Paul. Yes, I'm here, uh, China Prado, as is Natalie Armstrong um, from our office. We wanted to share the screen. I'm not sure. I think I see the China Institute. Okay. Yeah, I was just taking it down, Tina. Um, oh, so sorry. You, the share share screen is going to you, not Natalie. Is that correct? You are wrong. I am wrong. It's going to Natalie. Okay, Don't listen, good. To, me. Don't listen to me. <laughs> Sorry, my lights are on a sensor, so if I don't move around, they set off. I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, here again. So we'll sort of we wanted to 
Natalie will share and then we'll get started. Tina, do you want to share your screen? Oh, I thought I had, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Great. So again, uh, hello everyone. It's nice to see you. Uh, Natalie and I are back tonight to share an update um, on the wayfinding proposal that we presented back in April uh, and sort of here to present okay. some updates and changes based upon the community board's uh, feedback and suggestions. Um, so next slide. Okay, there we go. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so just to give a, uh, for uh, the members a quick little recap as to where uh, about the project. Um, this project consists of the replacement and upgrade of the heritage trail markers and smaller wayfinding plaques and orientation columns along Broadway. The signs offer pedestrian wayfinding maps, of, offer pedestrians wayfinding via the maps and provide historical information on, speci on, the, on the specific area in which the marker is located. These locations, as we mentioned, are determined by DOT or were determined by DOT. We are responsible for the maintenance of uh, these street infrastructure pieces. In total, the project includes 26 heritage trail markers with uh, updated content vetted by a historian and new design stanchions, new design stanchions, um, new stanchions made with durable material and the same design, 15 wayfinding plaques along Broadway from Murray to Bowling Green, five orientation columns along Broadway from Murray to Bowling Green. As you know, the CB1 passed a resolution in April with, with, uh, that included several conditions for us to consider. Um, so we've paused the project and we're coming back uh, now before we go to PDC. Next. You're on mute, Natalie. I wanted to help clarify uh, some this this approval process for the signs. We've mentioned last time, um, NYC Department of Transportation is our agency liaison in this project. They will be submitting the application to PDC. Now to break it down, uh, the Heritage Trail Marker Stanchion, which is the sign itself, that is what we have been referring to as a replacement in kind. Um, this is considered a replacement in kind due to the Department of Transportation um, has identified this as a nearly identical to the original structure and the upgrades primarily address the existing sign failures and safety issues. So for our stanchion, the stanchion has already um, received DOT technical review and was approved. It also received engineering approval. Since we are going to PDC for the content and design, which I will get to in one minute, we are including our stanchion in this as part of overall context to what the new signs would look like. Um, and with that, you know, we are only talking about our proposed locations the existing locations only and not adding new locations. Now, number three is the, are the items that trigger our PDC approval requirement. These would be the heritage trail marker storyboards, wayfinding plaques and orientation columns due to the updated content and design that we will show you this evening. Great. Next slide. So, um, I know a, a lot of folks on the committee had some questions about the historian and um, and the process that we were undergoing. 
So we wanted just to give some information about what PDC requires and so, so inform you a little bit more about, about the historian that we're working with. So the PDC Design Commission requires one, a written statement by the professional historian with relevant expertise confirming that he or she vetted the content and is historically accurate, including additional research undertaken since its conceptual review. A curriculum vitae for the consulted historian needs to be submitted as well. We have uh, the Alliance has partnered with the city, as we mentioned, the City Museum of New York, and the consulted historian for this project is Dr. Azra Dawood. Um, and we decided to engage with her uh, as a professional historian to revise the historical content on each of the markers on its location and to include a more inclusive representation of Native Americans, African Americans, and the LGBT community in lower Manhattan. I do have her CV that I'm going to post in the chat so the committee can uh, take a look and see. She all, this information will also be submitted to PDC. Um, if you give me a second, I can do that for you. Post it here. There we go. So if you are able to, you can click the link and you can see from Ms. Uh, Dr. Dawood's uh, CV that she has an extensive education experience and is uh, a very qualified historian to be our partner on this project. Next. The map here shows the 26 locations that will be replaced with a new heritage trail marker sign. Um, you can take a look. This map also notes ones in which they have a backside that shows a map, which is a Walk NYC DOT map. And here is a list of all the Heritage Trail Markers titles. These titles are location based, based on the geography of where the sign is located. And they give you a little insight into what topics are discussed on each sign. Um, these are the ones included in our proposal. Uh, so next, as you know, uh, the committee came up with uh, a list of conditions in the resolution. I've posted them here for just for a visual. Um, and as I stated at the full board meeting, when I gave a statement that the pro this project has been given um, all along the way, a strong direction from DOT, who's our lead agency partner. And I want to go through the list to, um, I want to go through the list to see, to go through the ones that we are looking to take on and, and make changes to the, to the original proposal. So uh, DOT access to fire placements in kind that replicate the existing stanchions, as Natalie mentioned, as well as the plaques and orientation columns, which precludes, uh, unfortunately, a design competition they wanted the new stanchions to look like the existing ones, but with modern and uh, durable materials. Next. So the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to uh, use the use of Lower Manhattan instead of downtown. So you'll see here on this heritage trail marker, it used to say in the original proposal, explore downtown. It now says explore Lower Manhattan that will be added to all of the anywhere where there was downtown will now say lower manhattan um, so that's something that we're going to fix in the title and wherever in the contact that is indicated next uh, number two we're going to minimize the size of the downtown alliance logo on all signs whether it's the markers the stanchions the columns you can see here this is another example of the logo only on the bottom right um, you can barely see it here, but it is there on the bottom. It's it's significantly smaller, and that will be on these as well as the one as well as uh, the other uh, signage. Number three, uh, this came up quite a bit from a few committee members to add more high quality images because some of them were pixelated and of lower quality, and also of course add the subway on subway icons to the signage where applicable. Next. Uh, number four, so the Alliance has decided to host and implement, uh, excuse me, QR codes 
or a similar digital platform um, with historical information that um, um, and connection to the neighborhood in cultural institutions. So this was something that will live on the web. Uh, the Alliance would host it on our website. It would be free and accessible to anybody to review, to look at, get information. You can click links and go to uh, neighboring institutions, other groups, like for example, the China Institute who just you know spoke today. This is currently in progress, I will say. Um, we've sort of decided to take this on um, as this project continues uh, along sort of as in the PDC route, this will will not be ready by the time you know we go to PDC, but it is something that we're we're committing to doing, and we're hoping that this would be something that would be um, completed by the end of the year, um, and uh, we will of course let the community board know as this develops and continues to move forward, and to sort of keep you updated. Um, and I say QR codes that probably will be what it is, but I'm not a, this is not my area of expertise, so I'm not sure if it'll be a different digital platform, but definitely something that people can use their phones and scan and, and get connected to that. Next. And these photos and rendering just show you the existing signage with our proposed update. Um, I wanted to show that the icons of the photos have been added back on. And I think this also gives you an idea of just how small the Alliance logo is on these signs. And we have been encouraged to, you know, keep logos on public facing assets in order to show who maintains them. And if there's any issues, you know who to contact. And this goes the same for our orientation column, just to give you a better look of how this uh, fresh design will look in the field. Great. Um, and one of, the last, one of the last points I wanted to make here was about the Freedom Trail and the African Burial Ground. I just wanted to clarify because I'm not sure if this was clear at the, at the original committee meeting. Uh, I mean, the Alliance is very supportive of the City Council's Freedom Trail proposal. Um, obviously, this is going through a legislative process. It was introduced a couple of years ago. We will continue to monitor this and its progress, you know, as a new administration, new mayor, new City Council comes in and would be very you know supportive of it was for it of it if it was to come to fruition so and the other item I wanted to mention was that there is an existing heritage trail marker dedicated to the African burial ground at Duane and Elk Street this is technically outside our bid district but it was one of the ones that when DOT had you know a bunch slated to remove we felt strongly about it and definitely wanted to keep it up and it's currently there at, at this location and also, you know, if there, uh, if the monument or the National Park Service would be interested in partnering with us on this, we of course would welcome the opportunity. I, as I understand, some of our staff have tried to reach out to them um, as we were undergoing this process, and unfortunately haven't been connected with anybody. So, if the community, if anybody in the committee has a relationship with somebody, please connect them with Natalie or myself. We'd be happy to talk with them. Um, and so I just wanted sort of to mention that because that was something that I, I think might not have might have been um, lost in the original um, presentation. Next, great. And sort of in in close. Oh, sorry. In closing, um, you know, given I wanted just to sort of end and say that you know, given the guidance and the restraints provided to us by DOT, we believe and the changes that we're willing to make, uh, we hope that. Um, the committee will pass a favorable resolution tonight and um, given the modifications that we've made within the scope of this particular project um, I do want to say that we do plan, I, I want to say that we do plan to proceed with the application process with DOT MPDC following the community board's decision tonight and at the full board and you know if the project was would not was not approved by PDC um, then uh, unfortunately the alliance we won't be able to obviously continue with this particular project or what the you know with the signage the three components of the project and um the markers unfortunately you know would probably end up falling into continued disrepair and ultimately removed um you know over time 
So, I mean, I think sure. I, I stated before and I want to sort of state again or sort of end on this note that we have been um, willing stewards of these markers because we believe they serve an important purpose and it ha to help people learn about our rich history and of course navigate the area with the maps on the back. And hopefully we can replace these markers and update them um, and to avoid to have to remove them and to continually remove them due to decay. So um, I'm happy that we're happy to answer any questions you may have. I um, we sort of run through the other thing. I, well, the last item I think on the I'm sorry on the conditions that I didn't think I called attention to was there was one about a digital sign. There was a suggestion made about some digital signage um, that is sort of well beyond the scope of this project and what we're willing to do. I don't even think the city would approve something like that. I mean, I know the links are on the sidewalk now on the streets. So I, I just want to acknowledge that at least we mentioned that tonight, but that is definitely one that, um, you, know, we're, we're, you know, this project can't include and unfortunately won't be able to happen. So thank you. Happy to answer any questions you may have. We're done with the present. We have, I guess we can stop sharing <laughs> and talk. Okay. Thank you, Tane and Natalie. Yeah. And thank you for being responsive to many of the requests made by the community board. So with that, let me open it up for discussion and see what we want to do. Richard Corman, I see you're up first. Uh, that was from before. The hand never came down. Oh, okay. In that case, um, I, I don't see any committee members with any comments here. I do see three members of the public who wish to be heard. So let's hear from them now. Linda Jacobs, why don't you, oh, you're unmuted, so you're good to go. Linda, are you there? Okay, maybe we'll try her later. Um, let's go then to Jacob Morris. Oh, my call has been unmuted? Yes, you're good. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so uh, it's really a pleasure to um, uh, to see this revised presentation from the Downtown Alliance. Uh, uh, fortunate to have um, a discussion, a, a very uh, frank and forthcoming discussion uh, with the uh, Alliance this morning. Um, and um, personally, I think they've been very responsive. Um, you know, there's limitations as to what they can do and what they can't do. Um, so uh, I want to say personally that in regards to the uh, quality of panels, um, I feel that they've uh, contracted for uh, uh, laminated, high pressure laminated thermoplastics that'll be you know, higher resolution and uh, will uh, be much easier to maintain. Um, I do want to make a point that um, regardless of uh, that they have a qualified historian uh, who has vetted the text content of the panels uh, proposed, um, the Alliance is absolutely cognizant that if there are egregious errors in the text, that um, basically, uh, and they do get pointed out at some point in the future, e even if they're installed, um, and they're embarrassed that there's inaccuracies in the text and the uh, history, uh, and for me personally, the integrity and accuracy of the history in the uh, text that's presented um, in its physical manifestation on the panels is critically important. 
um, if it comes to be that they find some some egregious inaccuracies, so get noticed by the public, and I'm sure they will if they happen to be inaccurate, uh, that the Alliance will um, be responsible for replacing the panel. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I know that they are, um, they don't want that to happen. <laughs> and, um, and I have confidence in the Alliance that they're gonna do a good job as best as they can. And I think that'll be a, a quite a good job. Um, in regards to the uh, cyberspace dimension, uh, I'm very heartened by that. I think that's a tremendous development. Um, and uh, uh, on that, uh, there's many different uh, special areas of history, um, a range of specialties that um, the signage represents. And so in the course of uh, adding this cyberspace dimension, um, the Alliance has indicated uh, to myself and my associate uh, that, that they're open to other historians um, collaborating on the content of the cyberspace dimension. Uh, and um, I think that's a, a beautiful thing. And I have confidence in the Alliance regarding uh, that um, discussion. Um, so all in all, um, I think this will be a good thing for New York City um, at this point in time. And uh, there's been a tremendous evolution over the past month since their initial presentation uh, and their responsiveness to um, what I sometimes call the art of the possible. And I want to thank the uh, committee particularly and its members for all their very intelligent uh, um, input at the, uh, the meeting last month. Thank you. And thank you, Jacob, for that and for your uh, participation in this all along. Okay, let's move along. Um, I do see a committee member uh, wishing to speak, Alice Blank. Well, I'm going to defer here to Todd Fine and Linda Jacobs. I think some of this outside uh, stuff is terrifically helpful and I, I may um, answer my questions. And I just want to thank Jacob for that very helpful comment. Okay. So with that, uh, why don't we go to Todd Fine? Uh, yes, um, I'm Todd Fine, the president of the Washington Street Advocacy Group, and I, I would like to um, to echo my colleague, uh, Mr. Jacob Morris, that that we were pleased that the alliance was open to have a discussion on this and uh, made some improvements. Um, I'm not sure I'm 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 thrilled with all of them, but I do agree it's an improvement. Um, that said, I think that the board needs to acknowledge in any resolution that this is a DOT proposal and the DOT has put extreme conditions on this that even prevent the Alliance from improving the Heritage Trail in a substantial way. Um, they're not allowing any movement of signs despite um, some, some bad locations, which I detailed in a memo that was uh, sent to the, the committee members. They're also not allowing any new signs at all even just a couple is in this proposal. And I think that's worthwhile because the current, I mean, even if we don't think about reconsider, reconceiving the whole trail, the uh, current uh, structure, as I detail in this memo, uh, excludes not only key locations like City Hall, Trinity Church, St. Paul's Chapel, the ferry terminals, um, but it also excludes an entire section of the city, which is the west side, the lower west side. Um, and it, we really have been advocating for many years for a sign for the little Syrian neighborhood in the lower west side, maybe also Radio Row. And I think it's 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 disturbing that while we're going to spend all this money on that, we can't on this new initiative, we can't even have a conversation about why we're excluding the entire west side 
of the city west of Broadway, basically. I don't believe there, except for maybe the, um, the American Stock Exchange, there's not a single other sign on the west side. And the signs for Battery Park City have also been removed. Um, as to the historian vetting it, I, I mean, it's a qualified historian. There's, you know, it's, a, uh, it's not a New York expert with, the, I mean, but that said, she's definitely qualified as a historian, but I, I would encourage the Alliance to have an additional review of the text. I think, you know, a small committee um, reviewing the text is advisable. Otherwise, we, we might have needless controversies and there's already some problems with some of the existing signs that have evolved over the years. And I don't think that one person, no matter how qualified, is capable of, of, of doing the fact checking properly. Um, but that said, um, I do feel the logo is still a bit large as well. I think that's up to the committee to decide if they want to say something on that. But I hope the committee would at least discuss that because there's also some some issues that 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 raise. But I'm not going to use that necessarily to to try to hold up this initiative at this point. Um, I'm pleased that the Alliance is willing to have a discussion. And uh, I also think that it, it's, it, and I, I'm to some degree want to make sure that the digital component is a little bit broader in its involvement. And I think that should be maybe another condition that the digital component not be another fate fait accompli that's given to the, the committee, but that actually involve um, other parties in that digital content, which I think is, something reasonable for the committee to request. But um, so sorry for all that speech. Um, you people, I encourage people to read my memo and thank you very much. And thank you, Todd. Um, okay, let me give one more opportunity for Linda Jacobs if she's on the line and still wants to speak. Are you with us, Linda? Okay, let's move along. We do have a couple of others who have their hands up. Um, Richard, are you up again for this or was that the old hand? Still the old hand. All right, so we're gonna have to take that Thanks, down. thanks though. But uh, Mark Amoruso, why don't you go next? Okay. Yes, I, I want to bring up the point that I brought up last month where regards to uh, what, what did you do with his, uh, historians? Like I brought up just one example of little tidbits um, that are around that uh, would be of interest to a lot of people. One, one I know about specifically the first Italian to, to land in New York is a plaque in, uh, is, I think it's somewhere in Battery Park. Uh, it's on the website of the parks department. So little things like that, 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 that should be included. That could really only be like a line or two. Uh, you know, I brought that up. Other people also had other, uh, things that they know about specifically and personally. Uh, I didn't see much of that. Uh, how is that being handled? Okay. Thanks for your question, Mark. Um, so, um. I will say that the mark, the 26 markers that we're talking about relate to exactly where the marker is. So if there's a marker or there was a marker in Battery Park City or in the Battery, the park, um, that is not part of this project. That, you know, so if there was somebody in Battery Park City that did something at one point in time, that is a new marker for sort of another, for another project, for another conversation. Um, so these particular markers, as we showed in the presentation, the list of the 26 relate to exactly where the marker is. If there's additional history of other people, even Todd mentioned, for example, little Syria on, you know, on the west part of the district, that is something that would be would have to be part of another project or another initiative that's not part of our purview at this time. Yeah, but the thing is, like this wayfinders are not necessarily supposed to be specifically at the spot it's to guide people in the uh in the surrounding areas so i mean if we're going to put up a, one of these things for every it, it will, there'll be hundreds of them around and it'll be ridiculous so uh, just a mention of this or that that's nearby seems an appropriate thing to do in my opinion 
Well, I think that maybe if there's a, in terms of the, uh, the digital component that we reference, that may be a place where we can fill in additional information on other parts of the district um, with some, with historical content. So how does that work? The digital, uh, how would that work? Well, we're, we're, we're developing it right now. So the committee came up with a suggestion. We decided to incorporate that. So on the markers themselves, for example, there'll be a QR code. You take your phone, you take a picture of it, it directs you to a website. And on that website, there'll be a lot more information about that particular marker and about the history of lower Manhattan in general. Now we are currently developing it, having conversations about that. It's early days, to be honest with you. So I can't tell you specifically, you know, what you know, um, what exactly it will contain. But that's something that we've committed to the committee here tonight that we're going to do. And so it'd be something that, like this: they they scan the QR code at a specific marker, and then yeah. that marker would come up, and then you'd have maybe something that says other points of yeah. interest nearby. Yeah. Yeah, and then they can absolutely. scroll down on that. Absolutely. And the, and the purpose of that is also is to link other neighboring, you know, and the, down here anyway, I mean, neighboring institutions like the China Institute, other museums, other cultural groups, other, you know, other entities that are focused on the history and sort of the development um, and the cultural development of the neighborhood. So that's, that's the vehicle I think for that was what you're, I mean, what I think you're. Yeah, because the to. frustrating thing would be, would, would be um, not to have that. And then they go to another QR marker and then they find out uh, later on that, well, why wasn't this? We, there was something we found out that we wanted to see and it wasn't there uh, listed. Right. So, and I think so, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, it's, it's yeah. in development, but the last point I want to make, I know Paul wants to move on, is that the QR code will come up with information about that specific marker and then also provide you the opportunity to direct yourself to other parts of the website to get more information. So, so Paul, can we add this to the resolution? A line or two about that uh, other historical points of interest, just simply historical points of interest. We don't have to be specific about every little thing that right. others historical points of interest will be will be included and they're going to continue to call, consult historians to to have that. All right, let me help with that. Can I ask one thing, Paul? It's sure. Alice. Thanks. Can I'm telling you that thanks very much um, for all the work. Can you just describe how, you know, I hear a lot of votes for the and concerns about this additional review of the text and what's included and the promise to, you know, remove any inaccuracies and such. Is there some way okay, that Alice, you... Alice, I'm sorry uh, about my point. We're going to include that, right, Paul? I'll come up with some language or so, uh, someone can help with that. Is that We're going to discuss that as soon as we get finished with this section, what okay. we want to put in, in the resolution. So let's, Alice, you finish up first. I just am asking a question. Thanks, Paul. Um, so I, I just was asking, Tana, is there a way that you could see that would work that would allow for this sort of oversight and, and having potentially other historians look at these? Uh, updated plaques and, you know, what would be in fact be included in the QR code additional material. Can you maybe just allow us, uh, you know, a kind of thought on that and maybe it's something we do want to consider adding to the resolution so we better understand how that would be done. You're on mute. I think you're on mute or I yeah. can't hear yes, you. Yes, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> um, <laughs> You think I know now? I think I know better. Um, so, in terms of the 26 markers that are going up now, that is uh, sort of currently underway and being led by Dr. Uh, Dr. Azra Dawood. So, as a, in terms of the uh, online uh, platform or the digital um, platform, that is where we can, you know, have a larger conversation with other groups in the neighborhood to provide information and to share resources on that. So the no room with the uh, with the with the uh, currently with the 26 that are there that are being updated, there's no room for other historians to review that is what you're saying, but just that's, yes, that's correct. That's correct. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, seeing no other. Uh, comments at this stage, I would like to recommend um, what I think might be a reasonable way to proceed. So, uh, 
basically, I would like to include elements like this in the resolution. It would basically be a positive resolution, but there would be a part two still. Okay, so I would include clauses such as, whereas the Downtown Alliance has responded positively to several recommendations they received from CB1, whereas much of this project is being formulated by DOT, and we could go into more details on exactly what they're calling for, whereas the signs are in need of repair and the work to be done will serve more visitors, visitors in a positive way. And obviously we would include a little more, but therefore be it resolved, CB recommends uh, that the Public Design Commission approve the amended wayfinding design proposal but I would also consider if the committee wants to again reiterate some ongoing concerns that could be possibly addressed in a phase two for this work or as was suggested by you Alice in ongoing discussions on issues such as identifying specific sites in lower Manhattan, as we've started to do even here, uh, China, you mentioned China Institute, the Performing Arts Center. Uh, Todd mentioned a number that he had in his memo, and I thought a lot of his were good. So perhaps we could have an open dialogue on that. You said that work would be done hopefully by the end of the year. So maybe committee, we could come up with this list and try to work with them on that. Um, the other issues that are outstanding that I don't know if we need to do much on, but I'll leave it up to you, is the design competition. You heard the explanation as to why that's not really feasible. Uh, number two, we talked about the whole issue of uh, consulting other historians, and um, we could reiterate that if we so choose. Um, electronic signage, it seems as though we are getting some of that with the codes being added to the signs, and it's just a question of what is included in that additional information that's available. So that's what I have here. So basically, committee, are you prepared to A, go with a basically positive resolution, but do you want to continue to advocate for some of these points that people raised tonight again? And, uh, but okay. at the same time, say that we think this should be approved so that the current rundown signs can be fixed and I think rightfully uh, point out that DOT is calling the shots pretty much here on what's going on. Yeah, I mean, Paul, I would just say that I think it's critical that we stay to our original resolution and identify those items that we thought were very important that haven't been addressed yet and, under, and it's understood perhaps why, but I would keep certainly the you know, those conditions, for example, the, the idea, particularly of the consultation with other historians and, you know, these different items that appear on the resolution. And I think that the points that are raised by some of the outside folk about pieces of history of downtown that in the next phase, or if this were to be added on to, should definitely be addressed in Mark's point as well, you know, more comprehensive. So I don't know where that fits in, but I wouldn't let that go. And lastly, I would just say, I don't remember the wording of the first thing you said, but any sort of judgment as to whether or not these things are adding to the, you know, you know, whatever the greatness of downtown, I can't remember what you said, but I, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that language. I don't know what it, what you exactly said. I think that's a judgment call, and I don't know that we can all judge that, but you know, it's great to fix things that are broken. That seems fair. So I don't know where that stood. No, all I said was that the signs are in need of repair and the work to be done will serve more visitors in a positive way. 
that was the language that I tentatively came up with. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that I would feel comfortable personally with that particular to say that it's in a positive way or not. I just think it's, you know, that you're fixing the signs and that's important maybe, but I, I don't know. <laughs> I just okay. Well, we <laughs> could hear from others on what everyone thinks. So generally speaking, is this a good direction to go in? Do you want to just fine tune this committee? Any other comments? Yeah, Paul, I sent you a whereas for my point. Can you read it? See what the committee uh, thinks. I, that the, all of the messages in the chat go to host. I can read that for you, Mark. Okay, but there's a, there's a little bit of typos, but I, you know. Uh, why don't you read it? Because I didn't notice it yet. Go ahead, if Diana. If you can. Read it, Paul, and then um, Art Piccolo. I didn't see a hand up, but he did message the host that he would like to speak. So, Art, if you could be patient for just one moment, I will read Mark's message, and then and then we'll get to you, Art. Uh, this is from Mark. The applicant said that there will be, this is a whereas, the applicant said that there will be a way for persons at a specific wayfinding marker to scan the QR code to see other nearby historical sites of interest and consult with historians. All right. Downtown Alliance, that's accurate, right? Can you repeat that, Diane, again? Because I was distracted for a minute. I'm sorry. No problem. It's a whereas and it reads the applicant said that there will be a way for persons at a specific wayfinding marker to scan a QR code to see other nearby historical sites of interest and consult with historians. I guess the last part consult with historians. That's about the creation of this platform, not necessarily the individuals going to consult with historians. So. Is that right? I guess the consulting with historians is that we're going to. There's two, I guess there's two responses. The first part is totally fine. The second part consulting with historians is about us um, working with the community and some of the folks who've come here tonight to create this digital platform. And to just say work with work with stakeholders. Is that better? I think that I think that I think that's better. Yeah. I just okay. you know, I think that's fine. All right. And I, and I yeah, and I work with, you know, I'm talking to Todd and Jacob and Linda Jacobs. So, you know, we'll right. you know. That's okay. good. That makes Thank sense. You. Okay, Thank good, you. good. I'm glad we're making progress here. Okay, so why don't we let Art Piccolo go? Go ahead, Art. Hi, am I on? You are. I guess I'm the only one not drinking the Kool Aid tonight. Um, the streetscape is one of the most important issues in our community, in any community. This is 2021, deep into the 21st century. And all that's being proposed here is a retrograde yeah. project that from 30 years ago. I think the project is bad, but worse is the process. The community board and other stakeholders should have been involved from day one. The alliance, if it wanted to do something with the, with the streetscape, should have come to the alliance and had a discussion and had them participate in this. I think it's very convenient. Uh, you know, Tanya and her boss are seasoned politicians. They have a they have a document from DOT that says our hands are tied. We must do this. Basically, DOT of course wrote a memo that they wanted to see. All over the rest of the city, there were all kinds of imaginative things doing done with the streetscape. The idea that the only thing that the city of New York would approve is doing here exactly what was done 30 years ago is absolutely untrue. I don't think you should consider passing this resolution again until you have somebody from DOT here, if they're the decision maker, and question them and ask them what the options are and ask them why they're allowing more imaginative streetscapes in other parts of the city. If you look, I've tried sending a lot of you some recent emails with details, uh, but I only have some of your emails. If you look at the uh, existing heritage marker that's on the corner of Wall and um, Broad Street, one of the most historic locations in the city, the only thing that that marker talks about is the architectural issues concerning one Wall Street and 14 Wall Street. Nothing at all about the incredible history beginning in the 1600s. So in addition to the issue of the participation of the community board in the process, you should not allow the alliance to decide what will go on each of any markers. This should be an interactive process from start to finish. You did not approve this project last month. 
I think you should reject it again. Coming out of COVID-19, we want, we all want an even better law in Manhattan. Take a look at all the incredible things that other communities are doing, that other cities are doing with their streetscapes and their signage, and this doesn't compare at all. The Alliance is a not-for-profit association with limited legal responsibilities. It, it is a representative of the major real estate interest in the city, not all the stakeholders in Lower Manhattan. If you don't know that, go look at their board of, director, elect, of directors. 90% of them are representatives of the major real estate companies in Lower Manhattan. You have no reason why you have to rush this. This is a very important decision. The community board represents the entire community. Force them to go back and give you options. Force them to go back and communicate and interact with the community board and the other stakeholders. Let's come up with some range of options and then have the community board vote on this. The idea that you have no choice, that you must approve this or there'll be nothing is absolutely not true. Okay, thank you very much, Art. Paul, I'd like to make just one point to uh, Arthur. Uh, our board of directors consists of what we are legally responsible to do for a business improvement district. We need to have 50% of our board needs to consist of property ownership. The other portion needs to be needs to consist of commercial tenants in the neighborhood. We also have community board chair Tammy Meltzer sitting on our board. We have representatives from council member Chin's office, borough president Brewer's office, city controller Scott Stringer's office, and mayor de Blasio's office. And we also have a resident uh, on our board representing um, the residential community. We have three people on our board who are actually on the community board who happen to live and work in downtown. So I just want to sort of clarify that one point that Arthur made, and we are adhering to the rules and the regulations as it relates to what kind of board of directors needs to be on business improvement districts. This is the same across the city, and we are following what is legally mandated for us to do in that regard. Thank you. And as I said, it does not represent the community the way that the community board does. Exactly. Okay. That's, why we're, that's why we're two different entities. Exactly. Thank you. And that's why we're debating it tonight. Okay, so committee, are we ready to uh, put forward a resolution? How many people are generally comfortable with the direction or how many people are not comfortable with the general? Hey, Paul. Um, I lost Paul. How about everyone else? I think he's buffering. Oh, there you are, Paul again. Are you still there? Oh, can you? Did, I, did I disappear? I saw something go wrong on my computer. Okay. You could so briefly, but you seem to be back now. So, does the committee want to move forward uh, on the basis of what I put forward earlier, perhaps fine tuning it a bit? Paul, well, there is something to be said about DOT being here and be able to uh, drill them as well. I mean, there is a point to that, and it doesn't necessarily have to be rushed. I, I mean, I understand. I, I understand both points of view here, but. It, you know, there's, it's not out of line either. Okay. Are there any other members that, of the committee? Paul, that, Paul that Richard, I, I have to agree with that. I, I think uh, Arthur, that's who was just speaking, made some very good points here. The Alliance has stated that their hands are tied, and I think we should be talking to the people that are tying them. Okay. Yeah, I think, that's what I meant. Yeah, Paul, this is Wendy. I, I think you should go forward with conditions like your resolution, what, the way you're leaning, and you can write these concerns in in the resolution, but I think we need to give it support. Um, but I think you can put strong reservations in. Like, I think that was the original point you were making. Yes, so we heard that Mark and Richard share the idea that we should delay. 
anyone else agree with that? I do think, Paul, it's Alice, that uh, the suggestion, which oddly we never thought about, uh, to have DOT in the room on this was not a bad one. I don't know what Alice the delay is. Or... Susan, Paul, I just got a message from Nick, um, Nick from DOT. Nick, I just moved you over okay. as a panelist, so you should be able to oh. jump in. Great. Oh. Good. Hi, yeah, this is Nick from DOT. I apologize. I joined a little bit late. I was coming from another meeting. So if there are specific questions, uh, I'm, I'm happy to participate. I, again, it, it, I tried to get here as early as possible, but also ran into some technical problems. So, uh, but uh, happy to address any of the committee's concerns. Um, thank you, Nick, for joining. Um, I guess a lot of people are concerned that uh, with the inflexibility of DOT's mandate that they gave to the Downtown Alliance. Some people were interested in additional signs and additional information on the signs, et cetera. We've worked through some of these issues, but any reason you were that inflexible? And then there are people who also think uh, we should take a little more time on this. So why don't you respond to those two first? Sure. So I guess, I mean, on the, the inflexibility piece, I, I don't think that uh, I would characterize our stance quite that way, but I, you know, I think we're happy to review proposals for additional locations. Uh, I think this was brought to us as primarily a, you know, addressing uh, serious maintenance concerns with the existing signs. And I, again, I think I mentioned this at the last committee meeting as well. We are very much supportive of that, right? We see the deterioration in the current structures. Uh, I think we very much from a safety perspective do uh, want to see those replaced. Uh, I will say, I, I think that there are a lot of siting constraints when it comes to lower Manhattan, just in terms of working around all of the existing infrastructure. So while the, like as an agency, I think we are happy to entertain proposals for additional locations or uh, certainly additional content. I think that obviously has to be balanced against all of the other infrastructure and siting constraints that exist in your community, right? It's, it's very dense. You have very tiny sidewalks. You have uh, a lot going on. So there's, there is always that to consider. Um, and I, again, I, I mean, I think fundamentally from a, uh, if we're thinking about this in a phased approach, you know, DOT's interest does lie in making sure that we address the existing uh, maintenance concerns with the current signs. We're happy to continue to work with the committee and the alliance on any uh, additional proposals, understanding also that this is not DOT's signage program, right? We don't have anything to do with the maintenance or the installation of this. This is ultimately managed by the downtown alliance uh, and maintained by them. So there, there is that. Uh, that piece to keep in mind as well. And I'm sorry, Paul, I forgot the second part of your, your comments. Um, let me just uh, see if anyone else has any other questions for you since you're on the line. I don't want to monopolize this discussion. Um, anyone else have a question for DOT? I, yeah, I would be curious, Nick. Um, thanks. I, I'm just curious if the Downtown Alliance weren't involved um, in putting signage out in Lower Manhattan, would there be any signage? Uh, again, the the agency does not install historic markers or signage. We permit it to be installed by other entities. So, if there are interested community groups or business improvement districts like the Alliance. Uh, we certainly work with them, but the this city DOT does not have a program to install historic signage. So the, the short answer is is no. Absent the alliance, there wouldn't be that signage out there. And what can I, I hate to be naive here, but I am. Uh, what are there any are there any uh, municipal signage you know pieces throughout the city? I mean, you see signs all over the city. Great historic signs. Is that the understanding? Is that these are all in some way privately funded, whether it's in the village, you know, many, many of those signs that exist on lampposts throughout the village, I can think of specifically. What, uh, how does that work or do you know? Sure, so uh, in historic districts in particular, there is a program that is uh, funded with support uh, from the Landmarks Preservation Commission and the, the, the Historic Preservation Fund. There's an acronym that I'm forgetting. 
uh, that actually does pay for those brown signs that you see on lampposts that talk about uh, the historic districts. That is a, a specific program that is worked through the, the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Uh, again, uh, funding from that comes from a foundation and we as DOT uh, merely permit its installation. Uh, we do actually help manufacture those signs. Uh, and the, the agency is obviously, of course, responsible for all of the uh, regulatory signage that you see uh, across the city. So, you know, that's that's where most of our expertise lies. So, thank you. So that is helpful. So, um, those LP, LPC signs, do we have any in, uh, are there, you know, in the South Street Seaport, in the historic district or on landmark buildings, do we have any of those? Um, I don't know. That's, I open this up to anyone to answer. I really have to say, I'm not sure I've seen them, but. So, basically, we have no other signage except for what I'm talking about. Lower Manhattan down here below Murray is that all we have are the Alliance signs and there's been no uh, sort of movement to look at other other ways to pr provide signage. Is that right? I don't know who I'm asking that to, but <laughs> I guess I'll Nick, I'll, I'll let you feel that one again, Nick, if you, if you can. Sure. Um... Yeah, I, so on DOT property, I, I think that is accurate. I don't think that there are any other additional historic signs. Uh, the Parks Department obviously has their own procedures associated with signage that occurs on their property. So there may be some uh, some signage in that respect. And obviously we don't regulate signage that goes on private buildings, uh, right? So if it's a historic structure, there's a lot that have like national register plaques or uh, buildings that have chosen to, to do something along those lines that falls outside of, of the OT purview. So I just don't know. Well, it certainly calls that into question the, you know, which kind of signage you want and why and where, but um, anyway, that's really helpful. Uh, thanks so much. Of course. So, so the question is, is that if, if we feel like there's signs that are missing for major landmarks or major, you know, places, uh, how does that get addressed if we want to add additional signs? If the downtown alliance is saying that they're just maintaining, they don't, you know, they're just do, maintaining something that was already there and you say there's no program and I don't think we have a landmarks uh, preservation blanket group for lower Manhattan, although I, there should be, um, how do you get additional signs put up or is that just an, a no go? Uh, I, I mean, from the DOT perspective, again, we're happy to uh, review and work with any group that is interested in, you know, uh, looking at installing signage, uh, I, I think that, you know, the, the real coordination would be with the alliance, ultimately, if there is an expansion to that program, but that comes with real costs on both the capital and the long term maintenance side. Uh, and obviously, as an organization, I, you know, I don't want to speak for them, but they have to balance those needs. So, I, again, from the, the agency side, uh, we're happy to review. Ultimately, any new sign does have to meet, you know, rigorous siting criteria. There are a lot of below ground constraints uh, and difficulties in siting infrastructure. But if there's a location that uh, is of particular interest and there's a desire to install a sign there, we're happy to uh, advise and work with the local group, ADNI, the community board to, to move that through the appropriate review and approval procedures. Um, but there just there has to be somebody there that's going to pay for it and maintain it because it's not something that city DOT can do. So, so if the uh, hired historians, multiple historians, however it's going to be worked out, hired by the uh, the alliance, say say at some point, you know, that there's a historical event in Lower Manhattan that has to be referenced with a with, with something that's you know major, and there's no place on the sign to do it. You're saying you're open to it. If, you're open to adding more signs, but obviously you're, you know, you just give the permission. You don't drive the bus. That, that's, that's clear. Correct. Again, we're, we're happy to review and look at, at, at locations. I, again, there are a lot of constraints, so I, I do want to be fair in terms of setting expectations. Um, but, you know, the, ultimately the agency is, is in the position of reviewing and approving locations, not of going out there and installing signs ourselves. So. Okay, thank you. Just to be clear, uh, Nick, one thing we've been talking about that seems to have agreement is to 
if we don't add physical signs or if we add fewer of them, we can add more information digitally through these uh, QR codes or other means to further inform people about nearby uh, cultural or other types of sites that would be of interest. Mm -hmm. I, assume, I assume that would not disturb you. No, we we have uh, we have seen that in a number of instances. Um, you know, I, I think from the agency's perspective, the only concern is that you know that that stuff can't be advertising, right? Like it has to be uh, content that is is historic in nature and not you know trying to sell a good. But other than that, uh, having that that additional feature, uh, uh, we don't we don't have any significant concerns. I just have one more question. It's, um, so who pays for the village signs, Nick? The, the, the brown the ones on the lamppost? Yeah. Uh, so that, that comes out of a, a, a landmark foundation fund. So it, it's the, there's a, I, I'm happy to go and find the exact name of the organization. I'm drawing a blank on it. Um, but there is a, a separate entity uh, that is, uh, I, I don't actually know exactly where they get their funding from, uh, partially from, I, I think, historic uh, preservation uh, advocacy, that kind of a thing. Um, but they fund those signs and then DOT uh, fabricates and installs them. So partly there is city money involved in the production of those signs, correct? Because if DOT is making them, then there's some taxpayer money in making these things? I don't think so. I actually think the, the costs... Uh, comes from the foundation and pays DOT sign shop. Like if you go to I, our, our yeah. sign shop, anybody can order a sign from our sign shop, right? We make them, there's commemorative signs that people can order. You can have your, you know, your name put on a street sign and you can buy that from us uh, right on our website. So I get, uh, I guess I bring it up because um, I think what's been raised here is it's just the inconsistency in the signage in lower Manhattan has always been personally rather troubling that, you know, things begin and end on Murray street and for better or worse, you have these downtown Alliance signs, um, you know, in various locations, but you go north of Murray Street, you really have absolutely no understanding of the history of the city. And there's a complete sort of disconnect between the look and the inclusion of that piece of the history north and uh, west um, and east, for that matter. I mean, Chinatown, you know, Tribeca and all the rest. So I, I've always... Um, yeah, I don't know, how does one, like, how does our community reckon with when we want it perhaps amplify the signage here and have more history identified north of Murray Street, what 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 do you advise for us to do? What would be the best thing to consider doing? Yeah, I, I mean I like on a personal level, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, right? Uh, from the the agency's perspective, it's just uh, like we are purely in the review and approval game in that respect. So I, I mean talking with your local electeds, talking with some of some of the major preservationist groups in the city that you know advocate across the city not just for specific communities there's there's really a, a big network certainly within new york uh and there are, there are some big funders out there that that really care about this stuff so uh, like it's really a matter of of getting the money together and the the sort of uh community organization around that uh to really make it a, a an important issue and uh then ultimately to have an entity that can execute it um, but I, I, again, I, I think for the most part, the agency, you know, for better or worse, we're, we're fairly agnostic about it. I think we think it's a, a good thing as long as it's something that can be maintained uh, and can go through the sort of appropriate design procedures. And that, for better or worse, does put up a hurdle, right? Like it's not something that just any uh, anybody with a couple bucks can go out and put up a sign on a lamppost, right? That's that's not something that we want to see either. So, thanks again, and thanks, Paul. And maybe you can share uh, share with uh, with this committee or with the community board some of those. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I want to get to that, but we still have several speakers who are asking to be heard. Um, we have two members of the committee, and then we have Art and um, uh, Todd, I believe, who want to have another word. So why don't we? quickly go to art first and i ask that you try to keep it fairly brief art thank you
quite a while that's related to this. There are thousands of electronic sidewalk signage all over Lower Manhattan. I think I've counted hundreds, if not thousands. Why is Lower Manhattan, south of Chambers Street, the only community in Manhattan and now many other boroughs that does not have those electronic kiosks? Um, I, 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 this is Nick from DOT. Are, are you talking about the Link NYC kiosks? Yes, there's there. Uh, this is the only part of Manhattan that doesn't have them except for four on Water Street. There are no others south of Chambers Street. If you go north of Chambers Street, they, they're all over every other part of Manhattan up to the tip of Manhattan. They're increasingly all over Brooklyn and Queens too. I find it impossible to believe that Lower Manhattan is the only place that does not have those kiosks well so I, I ultimately this is a question to direct to do it they're the agency that is managing the franchise uh that's installing those kiosks those are obviously replacement for phone booths uh and uh, again there are the ones on water street so they do exist in lower manhattan there are a, a significant amount of utility constraints in uh, installing those so uh, again you know the that may be one of the reasons uh, but I don't, I don't know uh, more specifics beyond that. Again, it's it's a question that do it would be better suited to answer. Okay, maybe we could reach out to do it and ask them uh, why there aren't more of those. Thank you, Art. Uh, Todd, you go next. Yes, um, thank you. So, with I mean, with all due respect, this this is a discrepancy. What what DOT is saying is a discrepancy from what the Downtown Alliance had said. You know, they they had said that 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 DOT wanted to eliminate these signs, wouldn't consider any new signs, and I I think first it raises questions about why really important signs like Trinity Church, St. Paul's Chapel, the ferry terminals, etc., are not in the proposal. To me, that's I don't know what to do about that, but I I feel that this means that we shouldn't insist on any new signs only be considered in a phase two. I think there needs to be a few select additional signs that are in a phase one, and that's not an unreasonable request, given especially as I've been pointing out that the west side is almost completely devoid of signs. And I would like to petition that the resolution say that a sign for a little Syria or, a, or maybe for Radio Row also be in the first phase, uh, I don't think that's an unreasonable request given what DOT is saying. Maybe we could talk about fundraising or something if, if the Downtown Alliance insisted on that, but they are responsible for a reasonable side system that covers the entirety of lower Manhattan. Um, and, 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 and the reason I say this is because I've been asking the Downtown Alliance for 10 years on this point. So it's 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 a long term issue that I've been working on and I was told that the DOT, you know, was the barrier. Thank you. Okay. We will discuss that. Um oh, to Paul, more... can you get an answer there? Because you have all parties in the room. Is there some way that that could be considered as an addition by DOT and the Alliance while we're Oh, well, there are people who are waiting to speak. Some people have spoken three, four times, and some people have not spoken at all. Oh, yes. All right. Just very quickly before I call on you, Joe, is that uh, is DOT willing to consider something like that before they go to the Public Design Commission? I mean, from the agency perspective, we're happy to review. Again, I, I think our, our interests do very much align with the alliance, though, in that we want to address the the very real uh, existing concerns with the current signs from a maintenance and safety perspective, right? So I I do uh, just want to make that clear. We're happy to work on that piece. I, I would be a little hesitant uh, if the addition of uh, new signs somehow slows down the fixing of the existing ones. Okay, I, I, I would like to add that the stanchion issue we were told is not part of the PDC approval. So that's actually irrelevant is from what we were told tonight. Okay, well, could I respond to this? All right, quickly, please. Sure. The 
you know, since we are going to PDC with the content and design approval, the stanchion is going as well. So we would like the package to be approved. The Alliance would like to add additional locations. And again, we have been um, open to this as a phase two to kind of reflect what Nick from DOT said that we are really hoping to, um, you know, not delay the maintenance needs of the signs that are out there. And there's, you know, so, sort of a history behind these heritage trail markers of the Alliance who has been the main stakeholder, you know, working to keep them in the district. And I think doing a phase one, taking this to PDC and um, seeing that it is approved before we spend time and resources in finding new locations uh, would be very helpful. As Nick said, there are a lot of underground constraints. It's a reason some signs have even been removed. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joe Lerner. Thank you. You hear me? Right? Yes, we hear you. So I'm a little confused at this point. So I think I'd like to get back to the beginning. So I have a question and then a suggestion. The question is, what happens if I know a group that wants some sign to put up? Where do they go in the first place? Who has to approve it and who pays for it? Anybody can answer. So if, if your group is proposing to install it on uh, any sort of DOT property, uh, your best bet is to start with the Manhattan Borough Commissioner's Office. Uh, and then they will be able to direct your inquiry further. Uh, if it is uh, anything other than standard signage, eventually it'll come on my desk um, and will also likely require a review and approval from either the Public Design Commission or the Landmarks Preservation Commission, depending on where it is you're proposing to install the signs. Uh, and, it, and assume it's approved, who pays for it? So uh, along those lines, we won't advance a signage proposal for review by any entity, the community board, PDC, LPC, uh, unless the entities that are proposing it uh, are paying for it and are going to maintain it in perpetuity. So those pieces have to be in place before the agency will continue uh, consider a signage proposal and even bother to review it from a technical perspective. Okay, uh, now, Kathleen, please excuse me, but I think we should bring this to a conclusion. And my suggestion is let's go back to the original thing we were talking about and vote on it one way or the other. And then we can form an ad hoc committee or whatever to delve further into this signage situation as to where, who, what, where, and when. So that is, uh, I'm gonna, Kathleen, will you yell at me if I call the question? No, I won't. You actually asked my question, so. All right. I call a question. <laughs> All right. So if you wanna go back to my original resolution, are you hearing me, folks? Hello? Yes, yes, we hear you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Diana, do you have any of what I sent you that maybe you can post? Sure, one moment. Okay. Okay, so again, this this may not be the complete resolution, but it'll give you the basis. So if you want me to read it, whereas Downtown Alliance has responded positively to several recommendations they received from CB1, whereas much of this project is being formulated by DOT. And as I said, we could go into a little more detail there. Whereas the signs are in need of repair and the work to be done will serve more visitors in a positive way. Uh, for Mark, we have 
whereas the applicant said there will be a way for persons at a specific wayfinding marker to scan the QR code to see other nearby historical sites of interest and consult with stakeholders. Therefore, be it resolved, CB1 recommends that the Public Design Commission approve the amended Downtown Alliance wayfinding signage proposal. And then we could discuss the therefore be it resolved, which I don't know that we need all these items in there at this point. Therefore, be it resolved, CB1 would ask, would still ask that T and Downtown Alliance strongly consider a phase two for this work that would address these remaining issues. Design competition, consult historians of varied backgrounds. Um, I don't know if we need this thing on electronic signs. I don't know if we wanna keep saying we want a design competition at this point. Uh, then I went on to try to identify some specific sites that were brought up by certain people uh, where either additional signs or the existing signs could be electronically um, changed to include some info on these items. And I would say the same thing about the last three items. I think we heard uh, an explanation as to why they're not in there. So I would just go with maybe the consult historians and the possibility of electronic signage to add these elements in the resolution that I'm putting forward. Um, I'd like to keep the potential for launching a design competition. If we were to go forward, it would be a wonderful opportunity to reconsider those perhaps. And I don't see why we wouldn't want to do that, but you know, I'm not going to stand on ceremony on that one. And then um, up further, again, I would ask that, can you just go up the page a little bit? Uh, Diana, yeah, I that's what just was mentioning before, Paul. I don't know the um, no, we don't need to go up too far. Um, uh, yeah, I can't. You, you I oh, God, the signs are in need of repair. I, I don't know why why we can't just leave it at that. I don't know why we're saying that you're serving visitors in a positive way. I'm not even sure what that means, but I, I would. I don't know that we need that, but anyway. Right. I, mean, I accept that uh, both of those recommended amendments. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else have anything? Well, I would just, for just for language purposes, Paul, uh, where we say DA strongly, DOT and DA strongly consider, I would just say this is what we want. We. We ask that DOT and DA uh, pursue phase two for this work. I'm fine with that. You have that, Diana? Pursue phase two? Instead yeah, I got that. the option. Thank you, Richard. Did, do, did we miss any of the other uh, rec uh, requests that we made from the first resolution? That are not that have not been met in this phase one. Did we get them all in here? Um, well, not everyone. Some of them were originally on the bottom of this. It, scroll down. Uh, Freedom Trail Incorporation partner with African Burial Ground and recognize immigrants and historic people. I thought during the con during the discussion tonight we did hear explanations and got some, we were satisfied with some of that, or if we weren't, tell me I'm wrong. Well, maybe what we should, an alternative is to say that as, uh, that we should work with, that they should work with the community board at the beginning of a phase two. And then we can have an opportunity to put all these things back in. I didn't quite understand why those things uh, can't be included. Maybe I just didn't catch that in the discussion. But um, if in fact we move forward with a phase two, which I would certainly hope we do, then uh, if we're part of that process, 
from the beginning, then we can pursue all of these issues at that time. I like that idea. Um, all right. I didn't catch everything. Did you, Diana? Are we talking about removing these bullet points to address later during phase two? What can you tell me, Richard, specifically what your uh, amendments yeah, are? Yeah, well, so, sure. My first one is uh, that DOT and DA or DA, whoever it is, uh, consult with the community board at the commencement of, of, of phase two work and can continue consultation during that process. Okay. And I would have that we leave these bullets in. I'm not sure why they would come out, honestly. Um, but you know, maybe other people have, you have a better sense as to why. Well, here's the reason that I came up with that based on the response from the Downtown Alliance, A, they said they're very supportive of the council's Freedom Trail proposal. So that's, I, I don't even know what the council's freedom trail proposal okay. is. So but Paul, that is, a, that is a, the whole point of that is that in the phase two, you'd want to incorporate that into the next series of signs and to be very cognizant of that. And I'm not sure what the African burial ground partnership, but I would guess that would provide information therein. But I just think that freedom trail incorporation and the recognition of immigrants and historic people seem valuable. I, I don't know why we would remove it, but um, the, the council is voting on the potential of having a freedom trail <laughs> In New York City, um, you know, a recognized freedom trail. So I, I don't see why we wouldn't want right. to incorporate I, it. I don't know. I hear you on that one. And I know there was some comments made that the African burial ground currently has signage. But yep. we will have ongoing discussions on that item next month. So you could leave it in, it's fine. All right, anything else, committee? So we're going with my original resolution without any uh, uh, changes, uh, except with the changes that uh, Richard had and a few others that I think Diana caught. Okay. Call the question, anyone? I call the question. Okay, anyone second? Second. Okay. Paul, I'm gonna do a roll call. Uh, let's see, let me get to my sheet here. Good, good idea. All righty, Paul Goldstein? Yes. Andrew Zelter? Mark Amoruso? I'm gonna abstain for now. Alice Blank. I think I have to stay on this for a night right now until I see it. Thanks. Well, I'll say yes. Okay. No, I've put, gone through enough here. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Paul, Rosa for your patience. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Alice. Rosa Chang. Chang votes yes. yes. Wendy Chapman. Chapman votes yes. Kathy Gupta. Oh, Gupta votes yes. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Gupta votes yes. Okay. 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 Elizabeth Lemire. Lamary votes yes. yes. Elizabeth Lewinson. Joe Lerner. Lerner votes yes. yes. Dennis Michael. Yes. Bob Townley. Richard Corman. Carmen votes yes. And David Sheldon. Votes yes. Okay, motion carries. Uh, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in favor and one abstention. Okay, thank you, committee. Thank you, Alliance. Thank you, DOT. We will see you next week, I guess, at the full board meeting. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Thank you all. Paul? 
Paul? Who is that? Joe Lerner. Uh, yes. Get ready with with additions and corrections for the monthly meeting. Well, we, we shall see. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see what we have. Uh, item three was supposed to be covered by Andrew Zelter, who doesn't seem to be here this evening. So unless there's anyone else who can provide that update, I guess we'll have to put that aside for next month. Okay. Uh, Paul, just so that you know, I'm also a participant at that, at the, um, Hudson River Park Advisory Council, but unfortunately, I didn't prepare for this. So, if in the future we need an update here, with a little notice, I can help. Yeah, I didn't know that uh, he was unavailable tonight, but um, thank you for that offer. And I know Bob Townley had in the past also served that purpose, but he hasn't been around for a while. Okay, why don't we move on then? Um, Brooklyn Bridge Banks and Dugout Visit. All right, I can cover that one rather quickly. On April 29th, uh, a number of members of the community board joined a number of people from DOT and NYPD, uh, specifically Tammy and Lucian, myself and Rosa, Betty Kay, Michael Francoeur, DOT reps included Ed Pinkar and uh, Joanne, Joanne uh, Kidder and Jennifer and NYPD had quite a few reps as well. So we, we did have an open and frank discussion and walk through and we spent a lot of time together. They heard us out. Uh, we certainly reinforced our interest in reclaiming certainly the bank space and in exploring the possibility of creating additional spaces in some of the DOT properties. Um, DOT was non-committal. They seemed to say they would get back to us and they would have to determine uh, what they think is doable. So we have to await their response um, and, um, I, I don't know that there's too much more to add. It was a beginning. Um, I would have liked them to be a little more positive. It seemed to me that NYPD was a little more positive than DOT, but I'll just leave it at that unless any of the other people here want to make any comments. Paul, any, anything come up about the beach? No, we didn't discuss the beach, sorry. Um, okay. So if no one else wants to add to that, why don't we just try to conclude with a couple of information items. Number one, um, the other item on the agenda, as you probably have seen, the African Burial Ground and International Memorial Museum and Education Center has been also put off till June. We hope to have more information at that meeting and a couple of CB members who are interested in attending will be there to join us for that discussion. So we look forward to that. Uh, one other point of information, I want to thank Diana, Jamal, and Therese from uh, Jamal and Teresa from Parks and Diana, is, of course, is with us and they played a big role in restoring the water at Imagination Playground yesterday in the Seaport area. We had gotten some complaints about that and DOT really took care of it very quickly and certainly with the weather turning as warm as it is, having a water element for the kids to play in in the neighborhood is wonderful. So thank you, Diane. I think you're the only one with us tonight. So thank you for that. And then we just wanted to uh, make you aware of some grants that are coming available from the City Parks Foundation. And I don't know, Diana, did you 
have a slide on that or did you have it on the chat or do you want I to don't just... have slides. I can read a few details aloud and then I'm gonna post the links uh, into the chat. So for the, uh, sorry, I was just making sure that I was unmuted. There is something called the New York City Green Relief and Recovery Fund, which is grants of ten thousand to fifty thousand dollars. It's open to nonprofit nonprofit stewardship organizations with budgets of fifteen thousand plus that maintain, program, and support the city's parks and open spaces. Applications are due by Friday, May twenty eighth. Uh, I'll post a link for more information. And then there's a second program called Green Slash Arts Live NYC. It's an in-kind production and equipment and or small grants of up to $3,000 program. It's open to individual artists and ensembles, community groups and arts and cultural nonprofit organizations of all types that will present free of charge, family friendly, performing and interactive arts programs or art workshops in parks, neighborhood plazas and select community gardens across NYC. Alice, I would bet that includes POPs. Applications are due by 12 p.m. noon, Friday, May 28th, and yeah. I'll post a link for more information. Great, and we should obviously forward that to any park organizations that we're aware of that we think fall that may be eligible. Um, and if anyone has any that they specifically want to suggest, do so. And I think that may be it. Anyone else have any items that they wish to bring up? All right, thank you committee for all the time we've spent on this wayfinding issue and for your uh, contributions on that and for the public as well. And I thank you all and see you next week at the full board meeting. Have a good night. Thank you all. Thanks Paul. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Thank you, Diana. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody.